John Richards is uh, um, one of my dear friends, and we have known each other for a long time. We've been involved in the Founders Organization here at BYU since about the same time, since 1999, 2000. And so I've known John for a very long time. We've spent entirely too many trips together. And so he knows too much about me, and I know too much about him. And so it's all, <laughs> it's all secret. I'm just kidding. But at any rate, uh, John is uh, uh, one of the consummate uh, best entrepreneurs in the Valley. Um, he actually um, was president of a publish publishing company in Seattle uh, for, most, for a lot of his early career. He co-founded uh, a company by the name of Infospace, which went public and uh, had a multi-billion dollar valuation. And um, so I just want you to think about that. It wasn't a multi-million dollar valuation. It was a multi-billion dollar valuation. And John was one of the early co-founders of that company and drivers of, the, of, of its success. Upon uh, uh, the company uh, going public, and, uh, and achieving its great success, John decided that it was time to give back. Uh, uh, so he actually taught here at Brigham Young University for about 12 years. He was robbed from us by Google Fiber, who uh, actually uh, uh, had him do the pilot uh, uh, run out of, uh, of Google Fiber and all of Provo. It happened uh, infinitely faster than anywhere in the country because it was under the uh, direction of an entrepreneurial leader. Um, just a couple of other things about uh, about John, um, he was the managing partner partner of Utah Angels. Um, he co-founded Boom Startup, uh, a tech accelerator that many of you have heard of, um, and he also founded the Utah Student Twenty Five, which will celebrate its uh, fifth year this April. A uh, great event recognizing uh, Utah coll collegiate entrepreneurs, and uh, that's been a huge success. Um, at any rate, John has uh, uh, five children, and he is a, a wonderful father, a wonderful husband, and grandfather of two. So he was hoping that that's going to be more, but the future <laughs> will give that uh, forward as time goes by. At any rate, we are very lucky to have John. You'll find him to be one of the most engaging, knowledgeable entrepreneurs that we've had. You'll see it in teaching, so I hope to see each of you up in... Uh, um, in 710 for Q&A. Please join me in welcoming John to the lecture series. Thank you, Scott. All right. He's gonna switch over to my slides. Who wants to be an entrepreneur someday and start their own company? Look at all this, you're being converted. I taught here for 12 years and I would routinely have parents um, uh, that would uh, call me up and say, you ruined my child. I want him to go work for Procter & Gamble, now he wants to start his own company. That's not, not what I want him to do, so that's a good thing in my book. All right, let me tell you a little bit about me. First of all, um, making sure that this is clicking over, might not work, we'll see. Is this going to click? Am I all frozen here? I hope not. Let's see if I can redo this here. All the switching, come on now. Uh-oh. I don't think HDMI likes this very much. I'm gonna switch over to the VGA. Can we do that? So if you'll switch it over to VGA. Try to do HDMI, it didn't work. Back and forth. There we go. Can you switch that over? I think we should be good. We good there? All right, this should work better. Okay, yes, there we go. All right, a little bit about me. So I'm an entrepreneur. I uh, was sitting in a class just like you in the Tanner Building in the early 80s. My fourth year of school is when I learned about entrepreneurship. A little bit late, I was pre-med with going after a chemistry degree and I discovered I really liked business. I had liked it as a child, but instead of going to medical school, I went up to Seattle, my hometown, and got involved in the Yellow Pages industry and had a company that printed Yellow Pages in competition with the Ma Bell Company. And in 1984, a year before I left school, AT&T was split into eight different companies. 
And it caused a lot of confusion, which means there was a lot of opportunity to compete against that big telephone company. And so I had a company up in Seattle. And then in 1994, I was doing the print yellow pages, and I discovered the internet. And in 1994, I said, oh my goodness, this is going to impact paper and ink. This is going to be able to put the database of a yellow pages up on the internet, and people are going to be able to access this through computers and other devices. So I launched the first ever Yellow Pages in 1994. And uh, for two years, a lot of people in my industry thought I was crazy, which means I was probably on the right track. And then in 1996, when Netscape went public and Mark Andreessen, a college student, wrote the software Mosaic, which allowed the web to come alive with graphics and not just be text only, there was a mad race for all things internet. And that was perfect timing for me. And I had 10 major companies want to buy my yellow, online Yellow Pages company. I was talking to Microsoft. And three fellows were leaving Microsoft. And they talked me into joining up with them and doing InfoSpace. And so we launched InfoSpace, which was a search company in the early days of the internet. Went public in December 1998. Um, all this sounds really easy to talk about in a couple minutes, but that represents about 15, 16, 17, 18 years of working 80-hour weeks. There's no such thing as overnight success. And um, I sold my print company and focused on the internet, and that's how it went. Retired in 2001. So let me tell you a little bit about the experience of how this works when you have the dream come true as an Inner, uh, as an entrepreneur. A lot of us, uh, what we want to do with our products and service is change the world. I really didn't think about money. I thought about, man, paper and ink, the Yellow Pages directory is obsolete the next day after it's printed, isn't it? Because businesses start up that next day and go out of business that next day, and I'm not going to print this thing for another year. So every day it becomes more obsolete, and I'm thinking, wow, I could have a real-time database on the internet, and that's way better, isn't it? And so that's what I did, and this caught fire, and I got most of the Yellow Pages companies in the United States to join up with my effort, and that's what InfoSpace uh, was a big part of InfoSpace and what we did. And so when that kind of momentum hits, and it was a hot period for initial public offerings on the stock market, and we were invited to go public, and it was a really interesting experience. Here's what happened. On, Mar or on December 15, 1998, InfoSpace went public at $15 a share. So as a founding person in a company, what type of price do you think I paid for those shares? What do you think? Anybody have any idea? Huh? Your time. My time? I actually paid a little bit of money. Sometimes it is just for time. It's safer, by the way, to pay a little bit of money so you have a firm record of who owns what. But I paid $2,500 for my full interest in InfoSpace. And as they say, that was very, very good for me. And it's an interesting thing to have this happen in your life. I also one time had the same similar experience um, with watching another BYU student in the next generation, two students start a company called JP Interactive, which later became Superstats, which later became My Computer, which later became Omniture, which later became Adobe Analytics. And students just like you sitting in a class in the Tanner Building, two of them had to do a project in a class together. The theater major ran up and tapped the information systems major on the shoulder and said, I want to be your partner for the project. And that's how Omniture was born. And they went public as well, doing the same type of thing. How does it work? Well, for me, I had three stock splits in about 18 months. And in March of 2000, it was at its all-time high of $138.5 a share, which split adjusted is $1,108 a share, coming from the $15, which for me, I paid about less than a penny per share. And that's about a 7,300% increase. Now, I tell you this only because it's an interesting experience in life to see this happen. 
One of the things I like to say whenever I talk to students at BYU about entrepreneurship is that I'm going to get you pumped about it. I'm going to teach you how to do it. There isn't a class I didn't teach at BYU where at least one person five years later was not a multimillionaire. That's a true statement. I can point you to many, many students during my 12 years at BYU that started incredible companies. Just two or three months ago, a student that... I met here, didn't know what he was doing, found me, I helped him through a few things, he just sold his company for tens and tens of millions, just like two months ago. Happens all the time. So, it's a weird experience though, and you have to keep your head on straight, and you gotta understand how the world works and make sure you don't go off course. So, in the next life, you can't run up and say, hey, Professor Richards, you taught me how to do this and I lost my family because of it. That's on you, okay? You have to react to it properly. Okay, after you make some money as an entrepreneur, the next part of your career is interesting. And it seems like everybody follows this pattern and you become an angel investor where you say, hey, I don't want to work that hard again. I'd rather have somebody else work that hard and I'll invest in them. And so I've done a lot of investments. I've done 65 direct investments into other people's companies that are starting up. And I've invested in hundreds of others being a limited partner in seed funds that invest in startup companies. Now, I'm here to tell you, this right here is the worst investment of all time, and it's independent movies. They're, the ter- they're terrible, terrible investments. Um, everybody loves movies. Don't ever invest in them. They're very hard to make money on. It's like lightning strike. Um, this movie came out, got one star rating in the Salt Lake Tribune and the Deseret News, and never made any money, okay? This one... This is the kind you want. This one's not bad either, okay? Lots of interesting ones. So an angel investor is somebody, again, who was a former entrepreneur or a current entrepreneur that sold their company and had success and now starts investing in others like you, students, starting companies. All right, what have I learned from my career as an entrepreneur and an angel investor? Well, I've learned a lot. First thing is, This is something that I really have concluded about myself. I am only good in companies with a a maximum of 80 to 120 employees. After about 120, I'm not good in those organizations. Isn't that interesting? And the reason is because I don't like bureaucracy very much. Now, who does like bureaucracy? Well, I'm here to tell you, some people thrive on it because they can cocoon themselves in a bureaucracy and have job security. But for me, I don't like it. Around 80 to 120 employees is when your first lawyer starts joining the staff, your first HR director starts joining the staff, and it becomes a lot less fun. And so I learned that about myself. There's others that can go the whole distance, like Josh James, founder of Omniture. He was able to go from two people all the way and stay the CEO and run the company, and he did a good job of it. And he was able to pull that off. For me, I know my limitation. I think I'm very good at under 40 employees. I really love the early stage. There's nothing more fun than having 10, 20 people all pulling in the same direction. You know each other's names, your families, and you have a vision for a product or service that you want to change the world with. Love that. The team is paramount. As an investor, I've learned a golden rule, and it seems like I have to get kicked in the rear end frequently to remind me of this rule. No matter how good the idea is, no matter how good the product is, the most important thing of all is the team executing on the company. Happens all the time. We would rather have an A team with a B idea than an A idea with a B team. The team always wins out. There's going to be lots of pivots. You've learned what a pivot is by now? Have you heard that word where you pivot and change your business model? Companies pivot all the time, and it's great teams that make it through. Another thing I learned about myself is that it's actually not as fun at the top as you think. You climb the mountain and get to the summit, you take a look at the view, and you go, hmm, okay, now what? It's much more fun climbing up the mountain and finding the path and making it work and Falling, slipping, getting back up, making it happen. That's much more fun. It's actually getting, the process of getting there, that is what's fun and builds your character, not being at the summit. So that's a really important thing to learn. 
Now, another one is a rising tide lifts all boats. We have to have uh, abundance mentality and not think scarcity mindedness where if that person's doing well, that's okay. We can all do well. A lot of us have latent in us a real scarcity mentality, a real envy. If that person's doing well, I must be losing because it's a zero-sum game, isn't it? But that's not how it is. All of my endeavors have been where many team members all got lifted up and had great outcomes. And that is the way to think about business. And I've learned that's who I want to be around, people that have that same attitude. Wealth has its pitfalls as well as blessings. At Infospace, the first 400 people in the company became multimillionaires. You think, oh, isn't that fantastic? Well, I'm here to tell you that I was the second oldest person in the company at around 34 years old. People in their 20s have a really hard time winning the lottery. And that can happen in entrepreneurship. Today, there's probably some entrepreneur, maybe dozens of entrepreneurs, whose company was bought by a big purchaser and they became millionaires today, all over this country. And what are they going to do and how are they going to respond to it? I had a sad story of a fellow next to me in the next office over. He and I were real early in the company, and he goes, John, I'm out of here, I'm leaving. I got 40 million, I'm done. And he quits and retires. He was a nice young guy, had a nice young wife, they were a nice couple, significantly younger than me. And uh, he uh, calls me three days later and says, John, guess what? I go, what? How you like in retirement? He goes, it's not so good. I go, what happened? And he goes, well, my wife got up this morning and handed me divorce papers. And in Washington State, that's automatically half and half. So she took her $20 million and left. And he was really sad. And I saw that process kind of repeat itself. Money doesn't fix problems. It just kind of magnifies the groundwork you've laid a little bit previously. Now, I'm going to switch gears now. That's enough about me. I don't like talking about me too much. So I really enjoyed my career. I have a wife, Susan, who's amazing. I'm really spoiled. Everybody that knows me knows I'm completely pampered and spoiled. I don't even know if I could survive without her. That's kind of scary, but it seems to be true. And I have four children. They're all very different. I have two sons. All of them went to BYU, all graduated from BYU in entrepreneurship, except for one graduating information systems. He's the lawyer. He's going to graduate this May with the JD MBA. My second son is an entrepreneur, and he co-founded Dev Mountain. Anybody heard of Dev Mountain? Anybody here? Okay. They're really rocking it and doing incredible. He's, it's really weird to see your kids become successful entrepreneurs and see them repeat and look like you're looking in a mirror from 25 years ago. Kind of funny. All right, I'm going to talk about something else. You ready? We're going to go fast. I thought, what could I share that would be really important with this group? And I want to talk about the crisis in higher education. There is a crisis. It's been written about, studied, researched, MIT and their technology review, Time Magazine. Big articles came out a couple years ago. Uh, there's just a problem. And I'm not just talking about these kind of changes going on, like massive open online courses, which are certainly having an impact, but just the whole financial premise of higher education and the return on investment of higher education. It's really interesting what's going on. So I want to talk about that. The tuition costs are soaring. The numbers I'm going to show you in these slides are all adjusted for inflation and normalized at $2,011. So what the dollar is in 2011. So this is not in your brain going, oh, well, okay, just for inflation, it looks fine. No, this is the same dollars, okay? So this is what's happened to tuition costs. Skyrocketing, four-year private school, going back to 1980 to 2010s, the 
few decades later, and we're seeing this tuition just skyrocket. Huge. Every year, 7 10% rate increases. When the product isn't really delivering that well. The last three springs in America, only one out of two graduates gets a job in their field. That's not good results. Also, in this, student debt loads are increasing. Now, you're at BYU, heavily subsidized by the church, which is fantastic for you, was for me, and it is for everybody that goes here. You're only paying for about 20% of what it should cost here. 80% subsidized, somewhere in those figures is what I think the numbers are. Other people have to take debt to pay these high tuitions, and they leave school with debt. It's even happened here at BYU. People leave with debt. And so you got to think, okay, here's a business who is taking 7 to 10% rate increases. The end product is not working quite as well as it should, and the customers have to take out debt to get it. Kind of interesting. So here's some of the stats for Utah. The average student graduates with $22,400 in debt. Good news is Utah's pretty good. Only 52% are ending with debt, but of those that do have debt, that's the average amount. Here's BYU. For the most recent year, they have stats, which is 2013, 15,700, and but it's only 30%. So a really good outcome for BYU compared to almost anywhere else, but still, you're concerned about leaving school with debt if it doesn't get you a job. Now, I'm going to share the next slide, and it's a very important slide. This slide shows you how much you, sitting in your chair right now, can expect to earn in your lifetime from working for the man. If you're going to go get a job and rent your time to an entrepreneur or an organization that in turn sells your time for many times what they're paying you. Isn't that what working for somebody else is, right? They have to make a lot more money from your time than they can pay you for it. So if they pay you $20 an hour for your time, they might be making $100 an hour from your time. If they pay you $200 an hour for your time, they might be making $1,000 an hour from your time, right? So here shows that it still is a great advantage to get a degree. High school graduates can expect to make $1.4 million over the next 40, 45 years before they retire, while a bachelor degree holding four-year degree holding person can make $2.4 million. That's a million more dollars that they'll have coming into their household accounts. Shows also that not a bad deal to get a PhD. So all these PhDs you know, they took an interesting course, and they're maybe not so dumb, right? Some good earnings. I know a lot of PhDs here at BYU have told me they're going to outperform this number. Okay, so society rewards PhD holders. And then professional degrees, lawyers, doctors, what they can earn. So you can take a look at this and look at lifetime earnings. Now, as an entrepreneur, I want to ask you this. What do you think I think when I look at this chart? What do you think? <laughs> Not very much money? Chump change? That's kind of accurate. Here to tell you that for a lot of people that Scott Peterson, are you still in the room, Scott, by any chance? I don't know if he is. Scott Peterson recruits to donate money to fund the great program at BYU, which is number four ranked in the country. These are called founders of the Entrepreneurship Center and their donors. If you were to show them these numbers, they'd laugh. They're rounding errors. There's 150 of them approximately that donate to BYU. You can go up on the wall on the seventh floor and see how much money they've donated. Some of them donated this much money just to the center. Kevin Rollins has donated millions upon millions. 
So it's kind of interesting when you think about it that way, isn't it? It's kind of weird how relative it is. I'm here to tell you that I know people that make this in a year. I know other people that make this every month. The funny thing is, is you can do and be anything you want to be. I wish I was your age starting over again knowing what I know now. There's so much opportunity in this world, so much potential, and you can make it happen. And you're at BYU, so hard to get into. It means you're really smart. And then if you combine that with knowledge and hard work, you've got to work. The problem is you can't be lazy. You can make things happen. Now, your job career prospects, unfortunately, for your generation are not very good. A lot of you are ending up in low-paying service jobs. I can tell you lots of stories of students graduating in the last three years and not getting a job with their degree and ending up in low-paying service jobs. Now, if you're admitted into the merit school program here, that's probably not going to happen to you. This is a really top business school. And if you've made it into that program, you can fall back, work for the man, and have a decent outcome and make one of those four-year degree type lifetime earnings. But a lot of people are having a real trouble. An average $19,300 a year. Not good. Also, internships. A few years ago, internships were really raging at some of the top companies in Silicon Valley, but then the lawyers got into the mix. And I was just at a collegiate entrepreneurship conference in Boulder, Colorado a week and a half ago. And unfortunately, the verdict is, is that free internships are illegal. The federal government does not like free internships. That's sad because it's a great way for you to get in at great companies and learn something. Um, we'll see how that all shakes out, but it's getting harder and harder to find great internships because these companies want to give you the experience, but they don't want to have to pay you like they do a regular employee. But the federal government says, hey, you can't do that because they're working like a regular employee and we want the payroll taxes. So that's kind of interesting. So you see now headlines like this. Most companies are getting this advice from their lawyers. So with that, unless they are willing to pay them, which some of the professional firms are. Okay, there's an alternative. And I just talked about my son, and I'm not here to pitch his company in any way, but he's one of these three companies I'm telling you about, and it's just something that's weird. There is a career path, software engineer, that is a negative 4% unemployment rate in Utah. That means if everybody who called themselves a software engineer filled every position, there'd still be 4% of the positions left open. And that's an interesting situation. But the funny thing is, is that the universities are not spitting out engineers to fill those positions. The CS programs at Utah, BYU, UVU, you name it, they don't turn out the right product. They're not meeting what industry wants. So that's given birth to these coding boot camps. And there's at least three in Utah, probably five or six. And you can go for 12 weeks for a cost of around $8,000, $9,000. And they have a 100% placement rate for jobs starting anywhere from forty-five dollars to $85,000. So this is an interesting. I'm not here to make a judgment, but this is what's happening in the entrepreneurial tech world right now. And these things are on fire. It's insatiable. They get hundreds of applicants for 20 open slots in each class. And, it's, and the companies around town, this is where they find them. Adobe, Money Desktop, now called MX, Symantec, all of these firms here in Utah. The first week in these 12-week programs, they're down taking the students out to lunch and hiring them. As soon as they're done with the 12-week course, they get a job. Now, what does this mean then? If I were you, what would I be worried about and what would I do? Well, let's talk about the future just a little bit. One thing about the future is this. This was a very interesting 2000 article. That's 15 years ago. 15 years ago, they took the time to look at what the world population was going to do over the next century. At the time, there were 6 billion people in the world. There's now 7 billion. And they were saying, 
When would it double from the six billion to 12 billion? What year would that be? What do you think they said? 2050 what? 53, anybody else? Huh? Huh? You know what the answer is? Never. Never. It's never going to hit 12 billion. The smartest people in the world concluded, and that's because of urbanization. Humans in the last 150 years have been going away from an agricultural society where 98% had to work 10 hours a day to eat, put food on the table to where now, where do we get our food? No lack of it, as you can tell, right? In grocery stores and rest, from within a mile here, how many places can we go get food super cheap with no work on our part? Think about it. Massive change, right? So what are we doing? We're aggregating in huge metropolitan areas. It's happening all over the world. And guess what? When you're agriculture working on a farm, having 10 kids means you're rich. Because why? You have 10 workers to work the land, and you can make more food than your family needs. You can sell it and be rich. But if you have 10 kids and you're a Latter-day Saint and you don't want your spouse to work and you live in inner city Chicago, what's your life going to be like? Are you going to afford it? Or downtown Salt Lake? Or even in Provo? This urbanization is making it very disadvantageous to have a large family. So that's a big challenge for Latter-day Saints. So a lot of changes coming afoot on what jobs pay, where things are going. Now, taking this to the next thing, I want to share with you something that is mind-boggling. There is a huge threat facing all of you, and that is robotics. Right now, and since the devastating Great Recession that started in 2007, have you noticed that the stock market since May of 2009 has gone straight up with corporate performance unbelievably high in terms of profit and stock price? Who's noticed that? Who's made money off it? It's been nice, huh? Where do you think that's coming from? Where do you think the profits are coming from? From technology. The profits are coming from replacing workers with technology. The unemployment rates also are not fully counted properly by the reports coming out of government. They don't count the people that have given up and are not looking anymore as unemployed. Only if you're registering as currently looking. It's really interesting. So this robotic threat is real. And I'm going to show you a video now. We're going to take a look at it and then have a chance to talk about some things afterwards. I don't know if you can turn it up. Eric Renolson and Andrew Mackey, one of the reasons for 
the job is recovered. Our economy is bigger than it was before the start of the Great Recession. Corporate profits are back. Uh, business investment in hardware and software is back higher than it's ever been. What's not back is the jobs. And you think technology and increased automation is a factor in that? Absolutely. The percentage of Americans with jobs is at a 20 year low. Just a few years ago, if you traveled by air, you would have interacted with a human ticket agent. Today, those jobs are being replaced by robotic kiosks. Bank tellers have given way to ATMs. Sales clerks are surrendering to e-commerce. Time and automated system. And switchboard operators and secretaries to voice recognition technology. There are lots of examples of routine, middle-skill jobs that involve relatively structured tasks, and those are the jobs that are being eliminated the fastest. Those kinds of jobs are easier for our friends in the artificial intelligence community to design robots to handle them. They could be software robots, they could be physical robots. What is there out there that people would be surprised to learn about in the robotics area? Sure. There are heavily automated warehouses where there are either very few or no people around. That absolutely took me by surprise. It's on display at this huge distribution center in Devons, Massachusetts, where roughly 100 employees work alongside 69 robots that do all the heavy lifting and navigate a warehouse maze the size of two football fields, moving 10,000 pieces of merchandise a day from a storage shelf to shipping point faster and more efficiently than human workers ever could. Do you think it's part of the new American economy? Bruce Wilkie is CEO of Quiet Logistics, which fills orders and ships merchandise to retailers in the apparel industry. This entire operation was designed around the small orange robots made by a company outside Boston called Kiva, and it can now be found in warehouses all over the country. Now this is the order that she's selling, right, on this screen? Yeah. In the center of the warehouse, she has to walk from location to location with a number code, and that's the innovation here is that the product comes to her. And all of this is pre-programmed? Nobody has to sit there and tell these robots where to go? No, no, it's all done with algorithms. A lot of uh, mathematics, a lot of science that went into this. Customer orders are transmitted from a computer to Wi-Fi antennas that direct the robots to the merchandise, guiding them across an electronic checkerboard with barcodes embedded in the floor panels. Once the robot arrives at its destination, it picks up an entire shelf of merchandise and delivers it to the packing station. It then speeds off to its next assignment. They know if they need to get from point A to point B, and they're not carrying anything, they can go underneath the grid. We call that tunneling, so they're very smart. You think they run into each other? Yeah, you think that, but it never happens. You have to replace the robots with people. How many people would you have to hire? Probably one and a half people for every robot. So it saves you a lot of money. Yeah. And it's not just going on in warehouses. El Camino Hospital in California's Silicon Valley has a fleet of robots called Pugs that carry meals to patients, medicines to doctors and nurses, blood samples to the lab, and dirty linen to the laundry. A hospital spokesman told us the Cubs are supposed to supplement nurses and hospital staff, not replace them. But he also believes that robots and humans working together is the beginning of a new era. Robots are now wielding scalpels for surgeons, assisting in the most delicate operations, allowing them to see and sniff their way through prostate surgeries with minimal damage. And they've begun filling prescriptions in hospital dispensaries and mobile pharmacies. Economic evolution has been going on for centuries, and society has always successfully adapted to technological change, creating more jobs in the process. But Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee of MIT think this time may be different. Technology is always creating jobs, it's always destroying jobs, but right now the pace is accelerating, it's faster we think than ever before in history. So, as a consequence, we are not creating jobs at the same pace that we need to. And we ain't seen nothing yet. The changes are coming so quickly, it's been difficult for workers to retrain themselves and for entrepreneurs to figure out where the next opportunities may be. The catalyst is something called computer learning or artificial intelligence. The ability to feed massive amounts of data into supercomputers and program them to teach themselves and improve their performance. What's the weather like today? It's how Apple was able to create Siri 
the iPhone robot. Here's a weather for today. And Google, the self-driving car. We've been amazed how rapidly this has been happening. This is Jeopardy. IBM's deep QA system that plays Jeopardy. We had a contest here to play against our best MIT students, the best Harvard students you can put it up against. And uh, not surprisingly, Watson won. And it's being used in real practical applications now on Wall Street and in, in call centers. On Siri, millions of people are using that every day. The fact that computers can now understand and respond to human speech, the fact that they can actually generate prose of decent quality, they can drive cars, they can win at Jeopardy. We're seeing technology demonstrate skills that it's never, ever done before. And it's putting new categories of jobs into the sites of automation. The 60% of the workforce that makes its living gathering and analyzing information. This piece of software, called eDiscovery, is now used by law firms in the discovery portion of legal proceedings. The job that used to require hundreds of people sifting through boxes and boxes of documents. We now have robots gathering intelligence and fighting wars, and robot computers trading stocks on Wall Street. It's all part of a massive high-tech industry that's contributed enormous productivity and wealth to the American economy, but surprisingly little in the way of employment. We absolutely are creating new jobs, new companies, and entirely new industries these days. When, when Eric and I walk to Silicon Valley and look around, the, the scale and the pace of creation is astonishing. What these companies are not doing, though, is hiring a ton of people to help them with their work. Because they don't have them? Because they can't find them? Because, because they, 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 they can't find them they need, but they don't need that many people to work in these incredibly large and influential companies. But to make that concrete, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google are now all public companies. Combined, they have something close to a trillion dollars in market capitalization. Together, the four of them employ fewer than 150,000 people, and that's less than the number of new entrants into the American workforce every month. And it's roughly half the number of people who work for General Electric. Ironic. All right. Don't have time to finish that video. You should watch the rest of that video if you can see that on YouTube. Did you hear some of the statements? One and a half times as many people to replace a robot. It takes more people than robots to get stuff done. Also, 150,000 employees only at Google, Apple, and what was the other company said? Combined. Used to be companies like Google would have a million and a half workers. It has 50,000. Okay, it's amazing. I worked at Google, by the way, last year. It was an interesting experience for another day. Now, I didn't want to show you humans need not apply because I didn't want to freak you out. But if you want to be freaked out, go watch it on YouTube. It's much more direct on this topic and tells you way more about what's going on. Now, what does this all mean? Here's the takeaway for today, and I'll end on this note. If this is everybody, the blue-blooded people the great test takers that can become professionals, really smart, intelligent people, born in the right family or just super smart, get the right serendip in their lives, they're always going to make it. Then there's the rest of us. And a certain number are going to be entrepreneurs. But then there's a lot of others, and this is what these MIT professors are saying, they don't know what they're going to do with all the people. Low paying service jobs, displaced or what? This is one of the greatest cases for becoming an entrepreneur I've ever heard of. I definitely want to be an entrepreneur and not somebody down in this section. I definitely want to create my own job. I want to be an owner of the technology and the robots, not displaced by a robot. And again, that's a physical or an intangible robot. So again, think about this. Think about your career, where it's headed. Make sure you're making wise decisions because gone are the days, I believe, where you can just float through and go become a middle manager at a company and float up and have a nice career. It's going to be very competitive, and you're not just going to be competing against other American workers. You're going to be competing against international workers who can work for $2 an hour, and then robots who can work for a penny an hour.
That's something to think about. For me and my house, entrepreneurship is the way. Thanks for your time.